I'm uh, Grant Goodall. I'm a professor of linguistics here. And uh, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about my own personal history and how I got involved in invented languages. So when I was about 12 or 13, I first heard of the language uh, Esperanto. And uh, Esperanto is actually one of dozens and dozens of languages that, was, uh, that were created in the 19th century. Uh, so this whole idea of inventing languages actually has a very long history. And at that point in the 19th century, there was this urgent need to invent languages, surprising as that may seem, because people, uh, they needed a way to communicate internationally. The reason for that was that all of a sudden, uh, with the growth of the railroad system, uh, it was possible for people to travel long distances in very short time. And so it was possible for ordinary people to go to other countries and find themselves in other language areas. Um, so that was kind of a problem that hadn't existed before. And plus the language learning techniques of the time were not so great, uh, not, not like now. And so it was, you know, it was hard to learn uh, languages and we really needed to. But on the other hand, people knew enough about the structure of language, uh, structure of languages, at least some types of languages, they knew enough about it that they could actually build their own. So that's what many, many people did as a way to try to solve this problem. Uh, building their own language and then sort of propose it to the world as a sort of simple, easy language that people could learn for international communication. Um, so this was like the, the conlanging of the time, uh, but it had a very specific purpose of trying to uh, help international communication. Now out of the dozens and dozens of languages that were created, most of them are long forgotten. Uh, Esperanto is one that has survived and really thrived in the, in the decades and centuries since then. So what attracted me as a 12-year-old or 13-year-old to all of that and to Esperanto? Uh, well, on the one hand, the sort of obvious thing I suppose was, you know, the idea of international communication and international understanding, that sort of idealistic view uh, was very, very attractive. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, but the other was that I had read that your ability to learn a second language would go away at the time of puberty. And <laughs> did I say I was 12 or 13? <laughs> um, so things were happening. And um, uh, puberty is the, often the onset of many anxieties and uh, things. And for most kids, that has to do with like many familiar topics. And I had all of those, believe me. But perhaps a little bit more uniquely, one anxiety that puberty produced in me was this idea that I'm never going to be able to learn another language. Um, so I'd better start going, I'd better start working on this now um, because uh, I knew that the process had started and, uh, and I, wasn't, I, wasn't sure if the, I wasn't sure if the window closed when it started or when it finished, but, but I was hoping that maybe it was when it finished. So, so if, I, if I work fast, maybe I could do this. And if it was a language that was relatively easy to learn, I should be okay. So anyway, that's what I did. Uh, and I did learn it and I began participating in Esperanto events. Uh, I grew up around the San Francisco area and it just so happened that uh, the Bay Area uh, then was like the center for Esperanto activity in North America. So there was all sorts of stuff to do in this very international community of, of um, uh, expats from a number of different countries, uh, refugees from a number of different countries, people you know, visiting business people and tourists. It was a very vibrant, very exciting community and I really took part of that and, and so as I began learning the language and then began using the language, Esperanto became part of my, my daily life. It became part of my uh, social network and, uh, and over time it became this language that, uh, that, I would, that I would think in and dream in and became part of who I was. That wasn't really the intention that I had starting out. I had this the other sort of goals in mind, but, but that's, uh, that's what happened. And that's you know, still true today, many, many years later. It is this language that just uh, feels like part of who I am and part of how I think and how I, how I dream and still part of my, my social network of people who I've known for almost all of my life. Now, when I grew up and 
became a linguistics professor, uh, people would often say to me, like, wow, how, how amazing that you speak an invented language. You know, a language that, uh, you know, that started out on someone's desk, uh, and now it's this language that you would, that you would speak. And I really resisted that. Um, you know, I would basically tell people, no, it, it's not amazing. It's, it's just a language. It's a language. I speak it. That's it. Okay? It's not, it, it's not a big deal. Um, so just, you know, just leave me alone. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not some, like, exotic object or anything. It's just, <laughs> it's just this language. But, and all of that is true. It is just a language, and in some ways it's not really that remarkable in some ways. But in other ways, I came to realize over time that, yeah, you know what? It, it is kind of weird. It is kind of strange to think that, that like, I'm, I'm expressing ideas, I'm formulating ideas and speaking using words and structures that started on somebody's desk in the 19th century in Poland, and now those are part of the sentences that I use in my life and part of my, my dreams and things. I mean, they're my thoughts, they're my dreams, but they're expressed using words and structures that somebody made up. That is kind of, I mean, even I have to admit, that is, that is kind of remarkable. Um, so I've sort of come to embrace that idea a little bit more. It's still, it's not, doesn't mean that I'm weird. It's just, it is this sort of interesting uh, fact about the, the language. So uh, later on, um, thanks to multi-year lobbying from my uh, friend and colleague, Eric Bakovich, who's in this room, uh, I got convinced to actually teach a course here on campus, uh, Linguistics of Invented Languages, where we get to learn about this really amazing history of inventing languages, which goes way, way back. I mean, we, we basically start looking at things in the, uh, during the Renaissance, um, and it's just, I, I think, and the students at least sometimes agree, that I think it's just an amazing history that many people don't know about. And it's amazing that it like starts in the Renaissance, goes through the 19th century in Europe, and continues to our present day. And thanks to people like Paul and David, who you'll meet more in a minute, it's like really going to the present day, and they're doing amazing things, and they, they learn about that. So it's so much fun to, to find out about and uh, see how that works. And then as a class, uh, the students and I invent a language uh, over the course of the quarter. And uh, so when, when the quarter starts, there is no language. The language doesn't exist. And, uh, but by the time, and then we slowly build things up, starting with the sound system and word structure and sentence structure and the like. So by the end of the quarter, students are actually writing stories, uh, writing poems, composing songs, uh, even having like little mini conversations in the language. And, uh, and I have to say, after uh, 30 years of teaching, it's, this is one of the most amazing and rewarding educational experiences that I've ever had. And uh, hopefully for the students, it's at least OK. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll leave it with that and uh, turn it over to the next. I'm Paul Fromer, and since I created the Navi language, I should greet you properly in the language. So what I said was, hello friends, uh, I see you, that's the I see you, that's kind of famous from Avatar. Um, Thank you all for coming, and it's a pleasure to be here talking about constructed languages. Uh, Natvi has been a major part of my life since 2005, and that was when I became familiar with some of these people who are very blue, and this gentleman who is definitely not blue. Uh, this is James Cameron, and I owe him a great deal. 
the, the situation was that in 2005, I was teaching at USC. I was a, a, a professor. In fact, I was chair of my department, but not in linguistics. I have my PhD in linguistics, but I wound up through a series of interesting events uh, in the business school, and so I was teaching management communication. Uh, and I got wind of the fact that Jim Cameron was looking for a linguist who could develop a language for a science fiction film. I found out about it, and I said, yes, I want this. Now, prior to that, my involvement with constructed languages was pretty minimal. Uh, what I had done is created some problems for linguistic students for a workbook of which I was co-author. It's called Looking at Languages. And I had created a problem in comparative reconstruction where you had four daughter languages and you had to reconstruct the parent language. Uh, the language family was called the Speak to Me family. Uh, but it wasn't a complete language by any means. I had also learned enough Klingon so that I could develop a syntax problem in Klingon. So I kind of used that as an inroad with Jim Cameron. We had an interview, just one-on-one, -on -one, 90 minutes, amazing 90 minutes, in his office in Santa Monica. I guess it went pretty well, because at the end, um, we stood up, shook hands, and he said, welcome aboard. And my life has not been the same ever since. <laughs> so um, this, by the way, is, um, is what I would see on the set. And of course, what you would see on the screen are these incredible blue people. That's called a, uh, a performance capture suit. So what I'd like to do is just give you a really, really quick whirlwind tour of the language. Take a look at it, see, see what it might be like. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, if there's time, we can maybe um, talk about some of the nitty gritty later on. But just to give you um, a sense of what goes into the language. Uh, OK, so the framework you can think about in terms of what you might call these modules. Uh, phonetics and phonology is sound. Morphology is word building. Syntax involves how the words are put together in phrases and sentences. And then, of course, you have the really interesting stuff like language, culture, and environment. So taking a quick look at the phonology, at the sound system, you have consonants and vowels. Um, you've got to choose a set of consonants and vowels that are going to be in your language uh, from among the huge number of speech sounds that are, that are available to you. So these are the consonants that I chose. Um, the ones that have attracted the most interest are on the first line. I wrote them as PX, TX, and KX. By the way, for those of you who are familiar with IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, you know this is not IPA. This is simply the spelling system that I derived uh, for transcribing the language. It's sort of a romanization system. Uh, so these are sounds that are that sound like and and the real language sounds. I thought it'd be kind of cool to include them in the language. Everyone seems to like them. Uh, it's just as interesting to see what sounds are not included. For example, you notice there's no b, there's no d, there's no g. So uh, linguists would say that the language does not have any voice stops. Uh, vowels, fairly straightforward. Uh, this one here is e, this one here is e. This is a, this is a. Pseudo vowels, u and r, which actually function as vowels. Uh, for diphthongs, uh, the ones that are most familiar are ow, i, and a. This one is a little bit less familiar, it's eu but it kind of forms a nice pattern. Uh, but once you've chosen the consonants and vowels, you're not at all finished because there are other considerations. For example, how do they fit together? How do they play well together? What, what does a syllable look like? So for example, uh, only 12 consonants of the 20 can be syllable final, and those are the ones in red. Consonant clusters, these are consonants that come together either at the beginning or the end of a syllable. So English has some incredible consonant clusters, if you're not aware of it. Uh, a word like strength, I love this word. 
Uh, it's, it's three consonants of vowel and four consonants in terms of sound, right? Uh, navi, oh, okay, so um, brick is a word, blick is not a word, but it could be, and bnik is not a word, and it could not be English. So these are some of the considerations you have to think about. What could and could not be a syllable in your language? Well, uh, these are, for example, the allowable initial consonant clusters, and they're pretty weird. Uh, you can have up to two consonants at the beginning of a syllable, but they have to be either an F or an S or a TS, followed by one of these consonants. So you can have some very strange combinations. Uh, you can have TS followed by N, which sounds like TS, and that's OK in language. But you cannot have KR, KL, you cannot have PL, PL. So a little bit unusual. So you have words like fngap, fpakim, skom, tseteli, tske, I kind of like that, and tsngauvik. I actually put together a spreadsheet with all the possible syllables, and it comes out to 8,690. Uh, that's single syllables. If you take those syllables and put them together in two-syllable words, then theoretically at least, uh, you can have over 75 million words, which is definitely enough for, <laughs> for Avatar. <laughs> OK, uh, you, but you still have French with the sound system because the question then, uh, then becomes, do these sounds ever change? Do they change because of position in the word? Do they change because of other influences? Uh, here's how you say in. It's me. I is minari. OK, the, world, uh, the word for world is Keith K. In the world is me, heave ke. Water is pi. In the water is me, phi. And so on, and so on, and so on. You see, there's something weird going on. And it's a phonological rule which says that under certain circumstances, being very general now, under certain circumstances, this sound will change into this sound. Uh, this particular rule is, is called lenition, but uh, it has some interesting aspects where ejectives actually change into non-ejectives and so on. But the point here really is that if you go to speak this language, then you have to take this rule, you have to sort of make it so natural that it just comes out totally naturally. Okay. And this sort of illustrates what's, what's going on here. Okay, words. Once you have your sounds, you have to kind of build words. What do the verbs look like? Okay, well, uh, Verbs in Navi, I think, are fairly interesting because you have a root like taron. This, by the way, is what the actors were given. Here's a translation of the line. Here's the Navi spelling, actual Navi spelling with a word for word gloss. And they found that this kind of thing was very useful, uh, sort of a, a quasi English -y phonetic kind of transcription. OK. Post avatar, the language kind of continues to develop. This is an email that I received a few days before the premiere of the movie, which was pretty extraordinary. <laughs> uh, people had gotten together and taken it, what existed already online, which was like a glossary and some other stuff, and actually sort of did their best to decode the language and figure it out. And it's remarkably good. This was at the very first meeting in 2010, a teach the teachers meeting. Some of these people are still very much involved. So these people have become very close friends of mine. Uh, there was a lot of fun. There was an outdoor class. Uh, there is an avatar meetup every year in which there is typically a language class. Is <laughs> one of one of the intense students in the, in the class. Uh, here are some things that the fans have done with the language. The fact that people have embraced this to the point that they're putting in so much work and really making the language their own is quite remarkable to me. We had a haiku contest. And I love this haiku. It was, it was, it was the winner. Sreo ma frapo sreo, ao a eoio, oza civico. One of the things I love about it is that the longest line, the seven syllable line, looks really short. But in fact, all these vowels are pronounced independently. So it's kind of nice. Uh, now, there are things going on other than Avatar. There was a, then there is, a Cirque du Soleil production based on Avatar, which actually incorporates a lot of the language and 
it was a lot of fun for me to work on that. Uh, if you ever get to see it, it's really very interesting. And there is now an Avatar theme park, uh, which is in Orlando, uh, Pandora, the world of Avatar, and they use quite a bit of the language as well. So um, with that, I'll say thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing David. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Don't worry. We'll make up for some time here. This is going to be short. So, uh, I, uh, my name is David Peterson. I created the Dothraki language. It's a language for these folks. This is a, a shot I was able to show that HBO gave me permission to show because it doesn't show anybody's faces and it doesn't show any of the main actors. Um, it's for, uh, I, I created it specifically for the, the television show Game of Thrones. Uh, but the show was actually based on a series of books uh, written by George R. R. Martin. That's my kitty. Um, and so uh, what I had to do was something different that I'd ever done previously as a language creator. I'd been creating languages for about uh, 10 years before Game of Thrones. But this was the first ever time that I was creating a language that already had its roots in something else, what we call an a posteriori uh, created language, meaning that's based on something. So this is George R. R. Martin. And he wrote uh, the books, and he included snippets of the Dothraki language, and he included them in roughly this way. So this is actually a line from the first book. So it'll say something like, Chalaka uh, Dothre, she, she shrieked. And then in italics afterwards, it'll say, The prince is writing, giving you a direct translation. Uh, it's actually very, um, very helpful as a reader because you actually get to see the language in action, but you don't have to figure it out. Um, I thought this was great because basically if you want to pay attention to it, you can. If you don't want to, you can just keep reading and you don't miss any of the content. I thought that was really nice. So uh, what I had to do then as I was creating the Dothraki language was to figure out how these elements worked, see if there was any consistency, and then build the language from that. This is how I went about it. Um, the first thing I did was, uh, well, it, well, first of all, it was a competition, I will say. It was a competition amongst language creators. There were about 40 of us. So I actually didn't create this list. Somebody else put this list together. One of the other, uh, one of the other language creators that was competing, Jim Henry, he put this list together, and then he gave it to the rest of us when he dropped out. I thought that was nice. Um, <laughs> but um, this is every word and name of Dothraki that appears in the books. Um, of course, some of these appear in phrases, but this is all of them. Uh, every single one through books one through three, there wasn't anything in four. So the first step then was to take all of this and figure out what the sound system was going to be. This is how I went about it. Uh, I had four rules, basically, that I adhered to. One was, uh, or, or kind of what I did as I was going through it. The first question I asked myself, what did I think that George R. R. Martin thought he was spelling? when he was spelling some of these words. Then I counterbalance that with what would a typical reader think? And in this case, the books are written in English. Most of the intended audience was gonna be English speakers, and of those, probably American English speakers. So I thought, okay, what, what is it that they thought when they were reading this? And then um, after that, since Dothraki was supposed to be a foreign non-English language, what would be plausible given the spelling and given the fact that this is supposed to be foreign so that it wouldn't just be restricted to uh, the sounds that are found in American English. And then finally, I added a fourth rule, which ended up messing things up for me, that uh, if there was a unique spelling, it would have a unique pronunciation. So you'll see how this uh, bears out as we go on. So the first thing I did is I respelled some words here. The first two are Dothraki. The third one is, of course, from High Valyrian. But uh, this is just for the sake of consistency. So if it was spelled with a Q-U, I respelled it to a K-W. Um, I got rid of C everywhere it appeared, unless it was something like a C-H which actually didn't appear. But just so that everything was consistent, and I wasn't saying that you know a C followed by an O is different from a K followed by an O. That's not what uh, an American English speaker would do. Uh, so there were a series of these consonants found in Dothraki that I figured would be mostly pronounced the same as they are in English, and those are them. If you just look at them and think, well, what is this pronounced like? That's probably, you, you're probably right on. So that was the easy part. Uh, next was uh, with digraphs or, or other characters like this. A digraph is when you have two letters that are used to spell one sound. I went with what I believe the English interpretation of those digraphs would be. So if it's spelled S-H, it's a sh, it's not anything else. Same thing with T-H. 
The J is a J, the Y is a Y, because that's how we do it in uh, America. Were he a German speaker, and these books were originally written in German, those might have been something different. Um, but that's what they were in English. By the way, the, in brackets, those are IPA. And believe me, it is endlessly confusing to introductory students that what we spell as J is spelled with this D crazy character, and what we spell as Y is spelled with a J. And then um, <laughs> the actual character Y is used, and it's a vowel. It's the vowel U, which is, uh, again, another source of delightful confusion. Um, <laughs> it's so much fun. And then there were other digraphs, and it was up to me how to interpret how these would be spelled. So with a KH, I figured any time an English speaker is writing something like a KH, they probably are referring to one of those back sounds that don't really occur in English. In this case, it seemed that ch was probably most likely. So that little X makes the ch sound. And people think of this as a weird, bizarre, exotic sound or kind of like a gruff sounding sound. This is a sound that's found in American English and you use all the time. Everybody uses the sound probably many times per day, uh, especially when watching the news. Um, it's found not in a word, but anytime you see something that makes you roll your eyes, you go, Ugh. That's that sound. It's just it can be in languages, too. Um, anyway, so yeah, everybody's pr quite proficient in this sound. Very simple. Um, and then for J-H, so we have something that's spelled J, which is probably J. Then you have something spelled J-H, which honestly is probably also pronounced J, at least in the mind of, of George R. R. Martin, I'm guessing. But I decided to adhere to the rule that if it's spelled differently, then it should be pronounced differently. And so I decided J-H would be J, a sound that we cannot spell in English. And you will know this if you ever tried to write out, as opposed to say, uh, the shortened expression per use. You know? Yeah, I went to the coffee shop per use. You ever try to spell that? Good luck. <laughs> anyway. So um, I decided to respell that thing as ZH, and this is why. It's an analogy down there. So S is to SH as Z is to J. So it seems like the spelling should follow suit. Doesn't it make sense? That's how you should do it, like for everything. But um, you know, it, it's a long road ahead of us. We're not, we're not exactly there yet. But anyway, so that's what the, that's what the J is. So uh, finally, then there were some non-English sounds. So there's something that's spelled Q. So I decided to go ahead and take that opportunity to give it the Q pronunciation. The Q is pronounced P, just like that. It's just like a K, except it's further back in the mouth. The back of the tongue touches the uvula, and so you don't say ka, you say ha, ha, ha. It just sounds like a funny K. It's present in Arabic um, and Georgian and many other languages. It's a, it's a nice, good, hollow sound. I like to think of it as like a drop of water. I don't know. That always made sense to me. For the R, um, I was like, well, we're not going to do an English R, so I kind of did a thing with it where uh, the R is very similar to the way it works in Spanish, where at the beginning or end of a word, it's a R like that. Otherwise, it's a R, 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 just like in um, a word like matador, the way we pronounce it in English. And it's spelled with a T and a D, but it's not a T and a D. It's actually this sound, matador, if you think about it. Um, by the way, if you ever have trouble with this flap and trill thing, my advice, if you know the Red Hot Chili Peppers song, Give It Away Now, if you listen to how he does the chorus, he actually approaches a trill and does a trill a couple of times. Give it away, give it away, give it away now. Oh, brother, now you can't use that. <laughs> it's copyrighted, sorry. <clears throat> it's an original song. Anyway, um, <laughs> the other decision was that if anything was spelled with two consonants as opposed to one, so you, that it would actually be pronounced differently. This is called the geminate. And uh, we kind of have it in English across word boundaries. So uh, if, you've, uh, if you think of the woman's name Allie versus the, woman na the woman's name Sally, and then you put a miss in front of that, think about how the S sounds in between those. So Miss Allie or Miss Allie versus Miss Sally. S is longer in the second one. So I thought, oh, that'll be cool to preserve. I love Geminate consonants. All right. So for everything else that was funny, I was like, all right, if you wrote it, then we're going to pronounce it. So that's where I, if it says MH, you pronounce it MH, even if it's at the beginning of a word. Same with HL or RH, all that stuff. I was like, well, if you don't like it, you should have written it, written it different. All right. <laughs> so this was, um, this was the full set of sounds that I discovered based on my analysis of what was present in the books. Uh, and you can write them up in a table like this, and you can see that it's mostly balanced. This is the set that I found. This is what the final set that I ended up doing. Um, these guys right here. So basically, I added one sound to Dothraki. I added a ch. I just felt like it needed to be there. 
And I removed the sounds P and B because I didn't find any examples of them. And so I thought, well, this will be fun. Let's just say that there was an older P and B in the language, but P merged with F as it did in Arabic and B merged with V as it did in Spanish. And I thought that was very clever. Uh, then later on after I was done, I discovered that I missed these two words. They're, both of them are names, Cal Pono and Cal Barbo, who is uh, Drogo's father. So there actually was a P and a B and I just totally missed it. Uh, but that's fine because I just uh, chalked it up to dialectal variation, which makes sense given <laughs> Dothraki. So, and, and this is kind of like uh, in English, if you ever, we, we still have this a little bit. There are still some people who pronounce the WH different, the hua, which, yeah. Anyway, so, I mean, we, we call them annoying, but they exist, no, but, uh, <laughs> anyway. For the vowels, I just did this kind of type of thing, a, a, e, o, u. Um, there was no actual u in it. This is the only place it exists. Two places where it uh, happens with a q, u, as opposed to where I respelled it, k, w. And also this misprint in uh, certain editions of George R. R. Martin's second book, where it says vice to loru, where it's supposed to say vice to loro. So that was the only place there was u, so I ditched it. Uh, I loved having consecutive vowels, so I made sure that those appeared. And that resulted in this. So you have this word spelled like this, and so I said if it's spelled that way, it should be pronounced different. And so the proper pronunciation is khaleesi. I should have realized that nobody was ever going to pronounce it that way. <laughs> and I should have respelled it. Oh well. Incidentally, you know why this is spelled this way? Because George R. R. Martin pronounces it uh, khaleesi. That's why. Yeah, I didn't know that. I'm glad I didn't. So those are the vowels of Dothraki. With grammar, I did kind of the same thing uh, with these four rules. Uh, that the translations were absolutely faithful and correct. Uh, Occam's razor, just do what's simple. Retain the spirit of the grammar and don't be cute. I'll give you examples of each. So, uh, if it says chalaka dothre means the prince is riding, then I have to adhere to that. Um, also, Occam's razor. So this is Cal Drogo, right? And then there's this phrase chalaka dothre, the prince is riding, and chalaka dothre mranha, the, a prince rides inside me. So the simplest thing to say is that chalaka is prince, dothra is riding, maranha is inside me. You could do uh, uh, something different, but I think that's coming later. Anyway, so retaining the spirit, this is where you see um, words change and they have suffixes, so they change meaning slightly because of suffixes. And then we have like vice dothrak, vice toloru, strong boy, where definitely the second word means strong. So in other words, modifiers come after the nouns they modify, so I wanted to stick to that. So when I created new stuff, I did stick to that. Again, more suffixes, changing words, and then strong kal. It's not like the adjectives are jumping before. And then don't be cute. So this is what I mean by that. So you have kal drogo, right? Kal is the chief part. Drogo is his name. Kal rahay mahar. Kal rahay mahar is the sore foot king. All right? So you could just say, I mean, it seems pretty obvious what's happening. You could say something like, maybe Kal means chief by itself, but it means sore when you use it to modify the old word for chief, Mahar, no. Like, you could do that. You could do that and come up with a bunch of cute explanations, but honestly, the, the readers of these books are going to be expecting it to work a certain way, so just stick with that. That was the idea. And so then I kept up with that, and then went on to create new stuff. So this is fleshing out the entire verbal system, or at least part of it. There are positive and negative vowels. So everything here is either something that's in the book or something that you shouldn't be surprised to find if you actually look at everything else in the book. So it's just a partial verbal paradigm. This is a partial nominal paradigm with uh, noun cases. Um, and you notice that there's no words for the and uh because they shouldn't be based on those two translations where you have, uh, and there's nothing like, am I getting to that? All right, well, whatever, you can probably figure it out. And I also, um, created uh, more words using the same uh, patterns that you see right there. Anyway, so uh, that's what I've got. This is, so now you know how to say something in Dothraki. Hajas, it kind of means cheers or also thank you or whatever. I mean, it doesn't really mean thank you because there's not supposed to be a word for thank you, but it means like, you know, be cool and thanks for listening. All right. <laughs> yeah. So for Grant, what are the core principles of language construction? And then for Paul and David, like what's your thought process knowing those core principles? And like what do you consider when you create the language? Um, is there anything more you wanted to say about that? Oh, sure. I could, I could, I could talk for 10 weeks about that. <laughs> um, well, I, I can just mention a couple of quick things, uh, or really one, one big idea, which is the idea of balance. 
So when you're creating a language, keeping things in balance. So, so Paul mentioned how you can like build up um, the sounds you're going to have in the language and then what syllables, how you're going to be able to combine sounds into syllables. And then you can actually like calculate out how many syllables that allows for you and you can get up to really high numbers very quickly. So from that criteria, you might think, well, the more, the more sounds you have, the better, because the more sounds you have, the more syllables you have, the more words you'll have to choose from. But of course, the more sounds you have, the harder it's going to be to distinguish those sounds, because you're going to end up with sounds that, that are very similar. And if the sounds are very similar, then you're going to end up with words that are going to be very similar. And then in a noisy environment, it's going to get hard to, to tell the difference between them. So, so you have to, like, on the one hand, you want to have as many sounds as possible, so you can create lots and lots of words. On the other hand, you want to have very few sounds so that words will be easily distinguishable from each other. So those pressures are kind of competing against each other, and creating a language, you have to find a solution, find a, a sort of sweet spot between those competing pressures. And basically, every human language is a solution to that problem. It's, there's many possible solutions, but so every language is a solution to that problem. And creating a language, that's basically what you have to do, is find, find that kind of balance between those two competing <laughs> pressures. And it comes up in the sound system. It comes up in the designing the syllable structure, word structure, sentence structure. This core idea just gets repeated uh, over and over again of finding a, finding a balance between competing pressures. Um, I too th think a lot about balance and um, one area in which balance is important to me is uh, the tension if you like between complexity and accessibility uh, knowing that the language is going to be scrutinized I mean this is inevitable in today's environment uh, 99.999% of the audience is just very happy to hear something that sounds like a language and they're, and, and they're convinced that it's a language. But you have that very small percentage who are going to go over it with a fine-tooth comb and, and, and examine it and want to understand the inner workings of the language. Uh, and so you want to make it interesting and you want to make it fairly complex. But at the other hand, on the other extreme, you can make the language so complex that anyone who really wants to get into it is going to simply throw up their hands and say, I'm never going to get this. So the, the balance here between finding sort of the sweet spot between uh, the two extremes of being so simple that it's really uninteresting and so complex meaning that it's impossible to, uh, to grasp, that's something that I think about a lot. When, in terms of creating the language, uh, the first... Um, the, the, over, the overarching idea is that there's a very specific goal, which is that uh, and all decisions are all decisions are based on that goal. So if uh, so, most of the languages that I end up creating are intended to be for realistic people who are more or less human beings. Even if they're aliens, they're basically human beings. And so um, the goal then is to create something that is uh, authentic to that group of people. And so if it's going to be authentic to a group of human beings, then basically it should be just like human languages are. And so that the way that I achieve that is by uh, trying to emulate the evolution of languages, which is that uh, languages exist in the form that they are uh, in our world today because they have been spoken by many people. Essentially what we have is the result, it's just a grand compromise. So the, the question is like, well, wouldn't it be cool to do this or so and so thing with the grammar? It's like, the, the question that I always ask is, how likely is that structure to A, be evolved in the first place? There has to be a method that that structure, that piece of grammar could have been evolved uh, from something older. And then how likely is it to stick around? Um, so, like, uh, one of the things actually, and then there are, of course, there are external concerns, and I'll give you an example one. Like for Dothraki, I created a structure that is not likely to exist for much longer. So the, uh, I showed you how there's four vowels in Dothraki. Originally there were um, one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Originally it was seven vowels. 
and then there were mergers that happened. One of the mergers was between the, uh, the back vowels O and U, so those two sounds merged. After those sounds merged, there became a confusion in the grammar between um, negative uh, forms, so negative forms for the verb, and um, inchoative forms of the verb, inchoative meaning become or growing or something like that, so that there are parts where you cannot tell whether something is necessarily past or present, positive or negative, inchoative or non-inchoative. This is uh, the type of thing that would not survive for long. But I did it on purpose because I was very afraid of them, uh, you know, after I created the grammar and translated stuff for the first season, um, not hiring me back and essentially kicking me out and then taking the language and doing what they wanted with it. And I wanted to be able to say that, even if they actually went through and learned it, no matter what translation they did, I would always be able to say it was wrong. Um, <laughs> and so that was an external consideration that had absolutely nothing to do with language. It was entirely based on paranoia. Um, I think what I overlooked, because very much that is something that would happen in Hollywood, but what I overlooked is that somebody would actually have to go through and learn it and do those translations, and nobody was willing to do that. So. Great. Um, so the next question is kind of a good segue to that. Um, can you all address the influence the language you create has over audiences' perception of the sociocultural dynamics of the population for which you created language? So what's the interplay between language, the language you create, and the cultures? Like, what do you have to think about? What do you consider? I'll, I'll jump in there, because um, it's a very interesting question, especially when it comes to the Thraki whether you're talking about the show or the books, um, the Dothraki are portrayed in a certain way, um, such that they seem to be more violent and more warlike, and then this is supposed to be somehow like more or less realistic based on if you study blah, 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 blah. Anyway, um, but uh, the fact of the matter is what you see on the screen most of the time are people behaving very violently um, in a way that's different from at least our modern society. And uh, for the most part, most of the, most of the Dothraki are portrayed as non-white versus the main protagonist that's always in these storylines, Daenerys, who's white. Um, and then there's the question of how uh, language interacts with that. So uh, when it comes to, because this also goes back to the earlier question, one of the things that uh, always happens with producers is when I devise a little bit of what I think the sound of a language is going to be like, um, I always get the same uh, feedback, and as if I have a sound like h in the language, they either say, oh yeah, that's, that's really good because these people are supposed to be gruff and violent, or they say, oh, actually, I don't know, I can't put my finger on it, but it sounds like this language is maybe a little bit too harsh, or I, I just can't put my finger on what makes it so, as if there is anything very interesting about the sound h, uh, or, or that it said anything about anything. It's an impression that people have, but it's not true. It's just a sound. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's just like K, except that you, um, your tongue is not up there. It, it, it hangs up there for a little bit longer. Um, so the idea is that when people hear a sound like that, they come away with the interpretation, at least English speakers do, that the sound is harsh, and therefore the people are harsh. Um, and so it's, it's something that that you could do, since you know that English speakers are going to react this way, but it's not true at all. It's just nonsense. And there's also parts of a language where people will come away with the interpretation, oh, this is this way because these people are that way, this way. And it's also completely untrue. Um, it's just, you know, ridiculous or nonsense. Um, but it's, it's all based on, I guess, uh, both cultural stereotyping and linguistic stereotyping because there's a lot of people that watch these things that really don't know a lot about language in general. Uh, and who believe things anytime you know, something comes out on an article where it's like, you know, oh, you know, if you, languages that are spoken around this area all have this sound in them because they're high up in the mountains and things like that. Um, I don't know. I look at this as an opportunity to say that, like, you know, yes, this language is this way, but it doesn't have anything to do with you know, the way that the people are. It's just that's the way language is sometimes. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything, positive or negative, with respect to the people themselves. I don't know. For not the, I would say that there isn't anything specifically in the sound of the language which relates to the people. 
which just echoes what David just said. Uh, for me, the most important thing was that it actually sound like a real language so that it adds to the sense of reality and the sense of verisimilitude so that you believe that this is a real race on a, another world that speaks a real language and then this is the native speech of the characters on the screen. And so um, for it to sound real and, to, and it to sound natural for these people for me was the most important thing. Obviously, almost everyone in the audience has no idea what the grammar is and no idea what, what is going on in the language. All they hear is sound. Uh, one thing that, 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 that perhaps relates a little bit to the audience's perception is that uh, Navi has, as I say, some exotic sounds, like the, the adjectives, like the to and the k. It also has familiar sounds in unfamiliar places. That, in fact, to my surprise, was what the actors had the biggest difficulty with. Because if you, you, you can take a, a velar nasal, the NG sound, nga, which is all over English, but it's never at the beginning of a word. And so for us, a word like nga, which simply means, in not, it means you, is very strange. Uh, what's also strange is to have the vowel i all over English, but we don't have it at the end of a word. And so to have a word, the word for hello is called i, which has some, you know, a couple of exotic things. So perhaps people say, well, exotic people speak an exotic sounding language, but obviously what's exotic to you depends entirely upon who you are and where you're coming from. Uh, a velar nasal at the beginning of a word may be exotic to speakers of most European languages, but to a speaker of Vietnamese or Thai, it's not exotic at all. It's just every day. Yeah. Did you have anything to add, Grant? Well, I'll, I'll just add about, uh, sort of reemphasize a point that's, that's already been made, is that uh, people often have this idea that the the sound of a language is a direct reflection of like the people and the life they lead and things. But, but as, as both David and Paul said, that's really not something that goes so much into the construction of the language. And we know from the way that languages work around the world that that really doesn't seem to be true. And when you think about it for a minute, it makes sense that it isn't true. You know, as I said before, each, each language is a solution to a problem of you you are putting sounds together to create words. You need to have enough sounds to create enough words, but not so many that it makes things very confusing. You know, so each language like does the best it can. And that's kind of a good lesson for life. It's not that like all these groups around the world are doing like really weird exotic things. We're all doing the best we can under the circumstances we have. And each language is trying to put together a reasonable number of consonants and vowels so that they can create words so that they can express themselves in, in language. And you've, you've got to have some sounds, and so it's in some ways almost an arbitrary uh, choice which consonants, which vowels you're, you're going to have, or arbitrary or at least historical accident. Great, thank you. Um, so a more fun question. So what is your favorite part about the language creation process? Or like, what's your favorite part about knowing a conlang or being a conlinger? For me, I guess, um, the favorite parts are the beginnings and the ends of language creation. Uh, the beginning is, is really wonderful when I'm thinking about the sounds that then go into language. And I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of person who just loves to roll around weird stuff in his mouth, you know, when I'm taking a shower and just, just try, try stuff out and, 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 and see how it sounds. Uh, and then thinking about the grammar, thinking about what might be uh, interesting and, and feasible and how this part of the grammar would interact with that part of the grammar. Um, I really enjoy that. And then at the end, I am delighted when I discover people who have, who have embraced the language to the point that they speak it better than I do. I mean, that, 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 that's really a, th a thrill. Hmm. Um, when you're creating a language, there are many different parts that are 
very, uh, they're interconnected but almost alien to one another. That is, they feel very different when you're doing them. Uh, so, for example, creating words, which is one of my favorite parts, just creating words feels very, very different from creating uh, grammatical systems. So it's like every, every, um, every little bit of language has its own systems and subsystems. So think about like, for example, think about English and imagine that you were creating the nouns and you created the system that we have. Well, what are, what are the rules there? What, what counts, I guess? So nouns in English have singular and plural number. Um, and then you have within that subsystems of irregularities when it comes to certain irregular nouns. Um, and then uh, in addition, you have this whole thing going on with articles, which is just a terrible, God, I hate articles. This is actually why, um, this is actually why most of the languages I create don't have articles. Um, I, was just, um, I was just listening to, I, I listen to a lot of, of Finnish heavy metal music, but on the way down, um, it was just like, no, articles are terrible. Like this, this, this poor song, what was it called? Um, Respect the Wilderness uh, by Sonata Arctica. So yeah, we do say the wilderness, that, make, that makes sense. But then they have this line, respect the nature, respect the land. And it's like, oh, that's not quite right. And why? We don't know. You don't really say the in front of nature like that. It just sounds a little weird. Uh, anyway, so you have to create all that when you're doing it. You have to decide, all right, where is it going to be appropriate to use this definite and indefinite article? You have to decide that there's going to be a definite category and it's going to work that way. So it's creating a little system. It's like half engineer, ha half engineer, I guess, E, and then half art E, I guess. Um, and and it's, a, it's a little play of both, and it just feels very different. And so I like doing each one except for creating verbs because they're a nightmare. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. And then, of course, one of my favorite things is creating writing systems, which we didn't touch on here. But I love creating writing systems and unique fonts, um, which I've gotten to do for some projects, but not, you know, not something like Game of Thrones because Dothraki is a spoken language that I've never written for. Yeah. So one other thing that I'll, I'll throw in um, is that Creating a language, maybe this is obvious, but creating a language is a lot harder than it might seem at first. And any, any of you who have ever tried it, you probably realize that pretty, pretty quick. And there's many ways in which you can go wrong, even from you know, starting with the sound system and, and building upwards from that. There's many ways in which you can do things in a way that a real language would not do. And then at the end, it's going to people can, can hear the difference. It's not, it's not really going to sound like a real, a real language, which is why I think what, what Paul and David have, have done and, and the final product that you see on screen is really so remarkable because it really does. They do sound like, like real languages. And f for me in the, in the class uh, that I do uh, where the students and I create a language, that result, it's like you have to do all this work like really quickly through the weeks of the quarter, and then at the very end, when things are finally coming together into sentences, and and you can read like a paragraph in the language and take some practice. But when you get good enough that you can like read it, and it sounds like a language, and it sounds like a language that has never been heard before, but it still sounds like a language. That's that's really just an awesome feeling. What is your favorite sound to hear? And what is your favorite sound to um, speak? I speak very little Chinese, but when I did study Mandarin for about a year and a half, I worked on the pronunciation so hard, mm -hmm. and I would practice in the shower, that I was kind of, and, and the tones especially, and the tone Sandy, but about how one tone interacts with another. Uh, I was kind of proud of myself for not being able to say very much at all, but what I could say, I said really well. Uh, uh, and I also loved studying Arabic because it has very exotic sounds like da and son, da and thin, and ah, you know, which, uh, which, which I found fascinating and wonderful. Uh, one thing that I was kind of delighted with, with Navi is, uh, I, 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 I don't know if, if this exists in actual languages that use ejectors, but in playing around with, with these 
interesting sounds. I discovered that I could put two of them together. And um, I could put the uh and the uh together, and I could actually say it. So um, there's a word, and it's kind of cool. <laughs> and, it, and, and it means land. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah uh, that is a great question. Um, actually, I think the sounds that I like the most of, are ones that are, have already been mentioned. I, I really like ejectives. And I think, as Paul said, um, any language in a sound, any, any sound in a language that you do not speak tends to sound very appealing, right? The grass is always greener on the other side. So I don't, I don't speak any language that has that nah sound at the beginning of a word, as in Paul's example from earlier. So I just, I just love that sound. It's actually tons of languages do that. And um, you know, if it, if it was allowed by academic regulations, um, any, any student whose first name was na or uh, last name was like Cantonese ng or Vietnamese nguyen, uh, they would just get an automatic A, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. But I just, I just like can't get enough of that sound at the beginning of a, beginning of a syllable. It just, just, just gives me shivers. Um, just let me add this because it was something that really tickled me tremendously. Um, when I was teaching at USC, there was one semester where I had, for some reason, a class that was about half full of Indonesian um, international students. And about half to a third of them had the same first name. And the first name was Fnu, F-N-U. And I figured, wow, that is really interesting. And it's not just sounds, but it's combinations of stuff. I had never heard F-N at the beginning of a word before, Fnu. But a lot of students seem to have that same first name. Did a little research. Um, many in, many Indonesian students only have one name, and so when you're filling out forms for the bureaucracy, you have to have a first name and a last name. And so if you don't have a first name, they fill in F N U first name unknown. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought Fnu is absolutely fantastic. <laughs>